Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Browser Hacking. Today, we're going to continue looking at Discord in the Serenity OS browser. So if you didn't watch the previous video, I would recommend that you watch that one first so that you can uh, understand some of the things that we're looking at, uh, because this is a continuation of that work. Now, uh, before I started recording this video, I had a quick conversation on Discord with Idan, who has been looking into Discord on his side. And he said that if anyone's interested, as far as I can tell, the reason for this error message right now is the missing element set attribute NS. But implementing that looks like a pretty deep rabbit hole. So it's really, really awesome to have other people like Idan looking at Discord as well. So today we're going to start by um, just checking where we're currently at. And then we're going to investigate what Idan is saying that set attribute NS is missing. Uh, and then implementing that, I guess, and seeing where that takes us. So step one is just let me just show you where we're currently at. Um, since the last video, we've had a small number of uh, improvements made. Um, the issue with a regex being run on a base64 encoded PNG image, it's still happening, but it's way, way faster now. Um, Ali found the problem, which was that we were running the regex once per character instead of once across the entire string. So it was a 450 kilobyte um, string. So we ran the regex 450,000 times. Uh, that's why it was taking forever. Pretty silly. Anyway, now we don't do that a lot faster. And then a bunch of other performance improvements as well. And then also, uh, as I mentioned on office hours, we now expose the window dot keyboard event constructor, uh, which was really the only thing missing uh, to get this error, apparently. Uh, so now we get to this part, which is great. And then we're seeing a bunch of exceptions being thrown here in the background. So um, probably going to have to do one of those intercepts again. Let's just do that before anything else. So let me just get this and then um, run prettier on it. And there was something that was happening repeatedly last time. It was um, they were checking for firebug, as I recall. So it's probably that thing again. But let's just go in and um, just patch that checkout, basically. Firebug. Yeah, yeah, this thing right here. So they're checking window.firebug.chrome is initialized. And we don't have Firebug, so we can just patch that checkout. No big deal. And uh, it doesn't change any of the behavior. It just gets rid of that debug spam, which we don't care to see. Um, so the thing that we want to confirm now is that uh, we're getting the set attribute NS failure that Edan was mentioning uh, and look at any other failures that can be seen in the log as well. And yeah, the other stuff that I did since last time. So uh, in the last video, I threw together this add color stop and canvas gradient kind of thing. Uh, since the last video, I've also gone ahead and uh, implemented that function fully to spec instead of just having a stub implementation. But um, as we make these videos, I'm going to try to focus on forward movement rather than just um, trying to do everything according to spec. Oh, shoot, I didn't actually uh, I didn't actually do the intercept. So I guess we can do it in resource loader this time. Why don't we do it in resource loader load something like this if Earl is this then Earl is uh, this instead. And now we're not going to make that mistake again. Mm. <laughs> Almost fell in the same trap as the last video. 
with the three slashes and a file URL. So once more, discord.gg serenity OS. Also, as you can see here, I've uh, cleaned up the debug logging a bit so you don't see all the spam from the CSS parser that none of that was relevant to what we were doing and it's just a bit more sanitized so we can see the things we actually care about all right so this is where we get and the last error is a sentry synthetic exception I think that's from the sentry sentry is uh, one of those open source Error reporting libraries, I think. Sentry.js. Uh, Sentry SDK enables automatic reporting of errors and exceptions, right? So I guess when they say something here like, we've tracked the error and we'll get right on it, um, that's because they're using Sentry. So they think that they're going to get right on it. Uh, <laughs> I hope that. I hope that nobody at Discord is uh, wasting too much time on the errors we might be reporting right now because most of the bugs are going to be in the browser on our side, of course. So, um, but of course, they can just filter that by user agent. Okay. So here is set attribute NS exactly as specified by Edan. So we are throwing because we don't have that function. That's cool. Before that, we have document.query command enabled, also missing. Um, before that, something called require is missing. All right, and then uh, there's a whole bunch of things, of course. Um, as we learned last time, there's all kinds of feature checks and stuff like that. And uh, I realized after recording the last video that the feature checks are coming from uh, Core.js, which is something that they're using. Uh, Core.js is sort of a modular standard library for JavaScript. Uh, anyway, we don't care about that right now. Right now, we're going to investigate those two APIs that were mentioned here. So query command enabled and um, set attribute NS. Now, Let's see if either of those are in that file that we uh, intercepted. So 91 um, set attribute NS. Mm -hmm. Secret internals do not use or you will be fired. <laughs> well, that's a that's a great name for something. I guess, I guess let's not use that. I don't want to get fired. Um, okay, so set attributes NS. We probably need to implement that. And then this thing here, query command enabled, was in a different file. So let's intercept that one as well. And let's do that. Query command enabled. Uh, what's going on here? I is the result of immediately invoking this function expression, uh, which just does a feature check, basically. So just checking if these APIs can be called. Um, so I think actually we can just ignore that one. Query command enable. I wonder if that's a standard API or it's a non-standard API. If it's a standard API, then maybe we care a little bit. Deprecated. Hmm. Well, as, as much as I would like to believe that deprecated means you can just skip something, it, that's not always the case because websites continue to use deprecated APIs. Um, but in this particular case, as we can see here, it's all within this try block. And if you catch anything, then we'll just return false. So us failing to uh, provide this API doesn't 
affect anything. I can tell. Uh, I I assume. Okay. So I guess that leaves set attribute ns. Let's look at that. Set attribute ns adds a new attribute or changes the value of an attribute with the given namespace and name. Okay. Well, let's see the spec. Mm -hmm. Sets the value of elements attribute whose namespace is namespace and local name is local name to value. Well, that's fairly clear. Here are the method steps. Uh huh. So first part is to parse out um, namespace prefix and local name by use, doing something called validate and extract, which looks uh, fairly involved. Fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. All right, then. Well, we got to start somewhere. So step one, element. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me actually, since I downloaded that other file, let's, let's intercept that one as well. Just for the faster uh, downloads. Okay, so element dot it'll. Where is set attribute? Okay, so we'll just add right here. Set attribute. And the API was Oh, set attribute NS, of course. Uh, right here. Hmm. All right. Yeah, we already have another NS API, get elements by tag name NS. So it's not the first namespace aware DOM API that we add, but um, maybe the second. Anyway, let's see. And then we'll need to add it to element um, the CPP or C++ class. So void set attribute NS. Uh, namespace, what was it? The local name and also the value. I think those were the, those were the things. All right, so here's our API. And what happens if we just do nothing here, I wonder? We just avoid these out. Just out of curiosity, like, what does that get us? Either way, let's see, let's get some of them spec links up in here. And let's get these steps. Mm hmm. Set an attribute value for this. Sure. Is this used in many places, I wonder? To set an attribute value. Oh, it's also used by DOM token list, which is another way to access the attributes of an element. Um, but of course, as usual, I'm, I'm just curious to see what happens if we just, we just make the API exist. So it stops throwing, um, what does that do to the page? Just out of curiosity. Oh, almost there. Also, it takes a, a fair bit of time when we load the page. 
uh, before we actually get to the error. And there's a heavy CPU churn for a while, and should probably look at that as well, see if there's something there we could improve just to get it to load a little bit faster. Maybe we're doing something silly. Um, even when it comes to stuff like performance here, I often feel like even though it's not strictly necessary to go fast, um, going unbearably slow can be very demotivating. And when you're staring at something that kind of doesn't really work at all, uh, if it's also slow, that kind of <laughs> that makes the experience even worse. So we should probably investigate what that CPU spike is. But we'll start by just checking what happens if we don't throw on set attribute NS. Yeah, look at that CPU spiking here. Chug, chug, chug. Many seconds of 100. Ooh, 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 ooh. Shit. <laughs> look at that. Well, this is already progress. Um, is that a is that an SVG background? Probably. Mm, yeah, that's. It looks uh, <laughs> vaguely accurate, but also clearly broken in interesting ways. So our SVG implementation is far from accurate, as you can see here. But it's kind of sort of resembles, obviously, what we're expecting. So that's good. Um, and then we have something here, some kind of rectangle. Don't know what that's supposed to be. Also, the page takes a, a moment when you resize it to re-render. Wonder if that is related to SVG, probably. Um, but this is fantastic. So what does our DOM look like? Um, bum, bum, bum. We have SVGs. Very cool. Um, and then what app right here? It's an SVG within the app. has all these paths and things. I guess this is probably this big SVG that we're looking at here has many layers. Um, great. Okay, all right. So this div right here, yeah, that's the one we're probably gonna have to investigate later. But I feel like we can't just leave um, I don't, I don't want to leave set attribute NS as a no op. So let's at least do something here. Let's print out something just to see what kind of stuff we're getting. Uh, namespace, local name, value. Yeah, I just want to see what they are. Name space local name and value. Also, let's, um, let's profile and see if we can catch that CPU spike while we're at it, because if we could make this thing not take 10 extra seconds to load, that would be kick ass. Serenity POS. Uh, uh Okay, so profile. Load the page. Yeah, like whatever it's doing now, that's what I want to know about. I guess we will know pretty soon. Set attribute NS coming up right here. Wait, is that just a single call to set attribute NS? Setting an xlink href. I guess it's probably setting an, um, an attribute within one of those SVGs. 
All right, all right. Let's disable the profiler. And then we can take a look. Okay, web content, very, very busy. Let's see. Okay, look at him go, just going here. All those purple lines are garbage collections. So heavy JavaScript action with very regular GCs. Kind of interesting. Um, okay, so let's take a look right here. What are we doing right here, for example? Three seconds of uninterrupted quicksort. What? <laughs> what are we sorting? Indexed properties. Mm hmm. Why are we sorting index properties? Because we are using an index property iterator. Operator plus plus. Wait. Um, hmm. So, okay, so we are in a for in statement in JavaScript. And then we want to enumerate all of the own property names. And then when we iterate through the internal own property keys, we use index property index property iterator operator plus plus, which um, oh, wait, is this thing creating a new vector of indices on every increment? That would be stupid. Property iterator operator. Operator plus plus increments index. And then if it's if we should skip empty indices, then indices is ooh, ooh, ooh look at this. Ooh, ooh. That's nasty. So we create a vector of indices in this indexed properties. So these are um, the numeric properties on a JavaScript object. So we return a vector of all valid indices. Uh, oh, yeah, right here is a quick sort. Okay, okay, okay. So this happens if it doesn't happen in this case here. But I mean, you still have to create a vector. But the quick sort happens if it's a sparse, um, sparse array object. So what this is about is, let me get a, let me get a REPL here. So if you have a JavaScript object like this, uh, you might have some properties in it, like that are, have numeric names. So um, foo and bar. And when these are laid out in a packed sequential way like this, um, we try to take advantage of that. And we just create a simple vector to use as the backing store for these properties. And that we call those indexed properties. Um, in the spec, the spec doesn't make any difference between uh, indexed properties and named properties. They're just one and the same. But for uh, as an optimization, basically all JavaScript engines uh, do this, where they separate properties that have a numeric name and uh, those that have a string name. So uh, the problem arises if you have uh, big gaps in your um, in your indices. So um, wait, what is this thing called? Get own property names, right? Yeah, so these are the own property names in O right now. <laughs> But imagine if you add a property here, that would be called something like nine, 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 like really far away. Uh, say there, Baz. Uh, if we just did the naive thing and used our um, underlying vector and just said, oh, well, you're adding a property at this index, so we have to resize that vector so it can fit at least this many elements, our memory usage would balloon like crazy. So what we do instead is that we have two modes of uh, storage for objects where uh, it can be either simple storage or uh, generic storage. Uh, that's what we call those. And the generic storage um, uses a hash map 
uh, instead of a vector. So you can have indices like wherever, and it doesn't matter if they're far apart or close together. Uh, it's all just a hash map. But uh, when we want to get the uh, indices in that hash map here, I guess it's because we want to be able to iterate over them in order, then we have to create a temporary vector where we extract all of those keys from that hash map and then sort them to make sure that they are in order uh, and then return that. So um, I guess there are a couple of different approaches you could take here. Like one thing is you could probably make um, instead of storing them in a hash map, you could store them in a tree so that they would be in order already. Um, but even so, even if you did that, you would still end up calling this thing repeatedly just, be, just because you're using an iterator. And I feel like we can also just cache the indices vector in the iterator. Um, so what if we just do that, like cached indices something like this. Uh, and then, wait, who uses that here? So operator plus plus calls skip empty indices. And skip empty indices, is that the only client of this thing? I guess so, because it creates it on the stack. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then what we'll do instead is we will just do this in the constructor because this never changes, right? Skip empty is always once you've constructed, that's always the same. Yeah. So we'll just do cache indices is m indexed properties indices. And then we will walk them here. So cached indices. Uh, now it's going to be a little bit of a rebuild, but I just want to make sure that we didn't break any JavaScript tests by doing this, but I don't think it would be, it wouldn't be correct to mutate the property storage while walking these anyway, I think index property iterator. Wait, who is using that? How were we using it? It was in um, enumerate own property, internal own property keys. Which is, is this the one object internal own property keys? Uh, has a for loop right here. Mm -hmm. Wait, so are we doing this in many places? There's another one. Um, this it doesn't seem like a um, typical thing. Yeah, because there should be no need to. We shouldn't need to allow random mutation while you're iterating the thing that that's just weird. Like we don't want to have that. So um, caching the indexes indices should be fine. I would think I would hope test JS logum and let's also rebuild serenity. Oh, no. What's happening? Oh, wait, it's my um, my throw exception printouts are screwing everything up. I just disable those. Come on now. Okay, all tests pass. Fantastic. So I think this is a no brainer optimization, just caching the 
valid indices in that iterator, which should make all of that time just melt away in the profile, I would hope. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and commit that while we wait for the build. libjs cache indices in uh, cache valid indices in indexed property iterator refetching list of indices every time we increment the iterator uh, was showing up in the profile showing up bright and heavy uh, or let's say hot and heavy in the profile in a profile of discord yeah that just seems sensible Also, now I'm annoyed that we have um, two members here that are primitives but are not explicitly initialized. But I also don't want to start the rebuild over, so I'm going to uh, get a run going first, and then we can start a rebuild because of those. Wait, what? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. It looked like it was gonna do a big, big rebuild right there. But okay, now we're up and running and I'm just gonna go ahead and explicitly initialize these two right here. Explicitly initialize primitive members of indexed property iterator um ba -ba -ba. okay 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 hmm so can we dig it Of course, now my machine is building in the background, so I should probably stop that to give it a fair chance of going fast. Still seeing a bit of a CPU spike here, for sure. But a shorter one. Still a bunch of stuff, though. Got me curious. Also, look at that resize time. Ugh. Um, I'm still curious enough about what that big CPU spike is that we're going to profile once again, just to find out. Also, we are kind of getting pretty close to the memory ceiling sometimes here. Maybe we should give the machine a bit more RAM. Um, wait, now it's just stuck. I mean, that's also educational, I guess. So what are you doing now? Hmm. Oh, I've seen this before. I think this is in um, the request streaming code where we're streaming an incoming uh, resource. Let's see. If I just open one of these things. Yeah, request stream into. Um, there's some bug in the request library where like the request response has ended, but it doesn't understand that it ended. And it just keeps um, waking up the event loop to receive more data. And then the data, there's no more data because it's end of file. 
Uh, so it goes to sleep and then wakes up again to get more data and so on. But that's a that's a bug that shows up every now and then. I've seen it before. Let's not get distracted with it in this very moment. Um, I guess we should try to make some progress on set attribute NS. So let's see, what would be the quickest way to do that? Well, we want to pass something to validate and extract. Sure. So validate and extract apparently returns these three things. So um, wait. Qualified name. Oh, I thought it was called local name. Oh, I don't know where I got the idea of local name. It was supposed to be qualified name. Wow. Almost made ourselves a little mistake there. Okay, so we're passing in qualified name and the namespace to validate and extract. Sure. And then we have to also invent whatever that is. So validate and extract result. Let's call it that so far. Which I guess is a struct of namespace, prefix, and local name. Which reminds me of our qualified name class. It's exactly what he has. So we already have an object representing this um, qualified name. So we can just return a qualified name. The DOM qualified name. Okay, so. And then we want to set an attribute value. So I think we'll call it Q name here, or let's just call it result. Set an attribute value for this using local name and value and also prefix and namespace. So let's implement this validate and extract thing. Validate and extract. All right. So we'll copy that here. Okay, we'll take these steps. Yeah, pasting like this rarely works out the way I want it to. All right. Yeah, these just have to be numbered. No big deal. If namespace is empty, I guess we should um, take these by value so that we can change them. Okay, so if namespace is empty, set it to null. Sure. Validate qualified name. How exciting. Um, how do we validate that? To validate it, throw an invalid character error exception if it does not match the queue name production. So it has to be either a prefix name or an unprefix name. A prefix name is something with a prefix followed by a colon followed by a local part. And an unprefix name is something with just a local part. Okay, and these are NC names, which are 
Um, bum, bum, bum. So what are they? Names that can have dashes or characters? I guess. Um, all right, I'm, I'm just not going to care about the validation part at this moment. We'll do this, leave it as a fix me for uh, future selves. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, let prefix be null. Wait, where is that thing that I was looking at? Oh, did I click on too many links here? Yes, I did. Okay, so fly string prefix is null. Let local name be qualified name. Sure. If qualified name contains a colon, then strictly split the string on it. Set prefix to the part before and local name to the part after. Okay, we can do that. If qualified name contains almost, let's try with a view. Aha. Okay, so then we want to split parts. Qualified name, view, split view uh, on colon, and then uh, prefix is the parts zero, and um, local name is the parts after. And then if there are more colons, I guess that's a fix me. Parts uh, greater than two. Yeah, that's a fix me for the future. If prefix is null and namespace, if prefix is not null and namespace is null, then that's a namespace error DOM exception. Okay, so we have to return an exception or here. Um, namespace error create um, let's see prefix is non null and namespace is null nice and descriptive okay if prefix is XML and namespace is not the XML namespace um the xml namespace is ah it's this string right here i wonder if we have that as a global somewhere enumerate namespace yes we do we do we do we do namespace xml then throw a namespace error exception. No problem. Prefix is XML and namespace is not the XML namespace. Okay. If either qualified name um, is XML NS or uh, prefix is XML NS, so either one of those is XMLNS and namespace is not namespace XMLNS. Then once again, throw the namespace error. Wow. Isn't it fascinating to write compliant DOM implementation? Um, some of this stuff is really dry, but uh, I guess you have to get through it. So let's do single quotes here just for just for the sake of it. Cool.
cool. If namespace is not the XMLNS namespace. And neither qualified name nor prefix is XMLNS. Okay, so. Okay, then return yet another namespace error, create. All right, almost, almost home. Return namespace, prefix, and local name. So we're going to create one of these qualified name objects here. Um, Passing in namespace, prefix, and local name. Yeah, so now we have validated it. Hmm. Wait, so if this is an exception, exception or how does this thing work? What if I want to throw, can I use try with this? I don't remember if you can use try with these. Try, because I know libjs uses try aggressively, but I guess you can't use them here yet. So do I have to check for is exception and then return it? Okay, yeah. So. We should probably make these work with try at some point, but at the moment, um, release val. Wait, no, not release value. Release exception. Can I not release the exception? Oh. Hmm. Okay, so exception or can definitely be made better by making it work with try and having a way to release the exception instead of copying it, things like that. Okay, so now we have the result. So we want to set an attribute value for this. And where was that? Set an attribute value. Um, Set an at no, we haven't implemented that before, so I guess that becomes a helper as well. Set an attribute. Okay. And it can throw, so that's actually an exception or. Set an attribute value for this using local name, value, prefix, and namespace. This is such a weird way of saying it. Um, like, because essentially there, this is like HTML spec pseudocode for calling a function. So set an attribute value for this using local name, value, and also prefix and namespace. Like, it sounds like there's like a secondary set of function parameters or whatever. Um, Anyway, so I guess our way of, of calling this is to pass in result, release value, and also the value right here that we were given. Yeah, that'll be okay. So this guy right here will take a qualified name, um, qualified name, and it will also take the value. Hmm. So what do we do? More steps? Sure. OK, 
Okay, if prefix is not given, set it to null. Uh, if qualify name prefix, what's the way that we check that? I guess we just check if it is null. So we don't really have to do anything for that because our qualified name type will encode the absence of a prefix as null. Same thing for these two. Let attribute be the result of getting an attribute given namespace, local name, and element. Um, so I think this is sort of doing the equivalent of set attribute. Is it not? Because we have the set attribute function, but it just takes a plain local name instead of a qualified uh, name. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think at this point we're going to cheese it and call through to um, We're just going to cheese it here and call through to um, set attribute instead of doing this thing. Um, and then we can come back to that. So here we will simply do result value local name and value. Fix me. Don't just call through to set attribute here. Yeah. But like in our case right now, and in most cases, this will work just fine. Uh, so that'll be a good enough implementation for today. And then we will leave the rest as an exercise for our future selves. Maybe qualified name should live, or the validate and extract thing should live here instead. I'm thinking, so qualified name. Does it have a CPP file? Qualified name CPP. He doesn't have it. Okay, well, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, implement add partial, add a partial implementation of element set attribute ns. Um, this implementation does some of the validation, some of the required validation, and then passes through the local name and value to um, element set attribute. Yeah. Hmm. And then when we have a fresh build, we can also grab a profile again. There are there are a bunch of different performance concerns I would have. Um but at this stage, I guess it becomes, at least on this page, it becomes more of a layout problem because we didn't see everything expected on the page. So uh, unless there is more JavaScript failing to run, uh, which we will know soon enough, let me just make sure we're grabbing a profile while doing this. Okay. Spiky, spiky. And finished. Well, this is awkward, he says. Why is that? Oh, dang it. <laughs> now we throw again. Uh, so my validation got 
uh, too strong. So what are we screwing up? Namespace is the XML NS namespace. So we can go and see where we're throwing this. Um, maybe I screwed up the condition for it. If namespace is the XMLS namespace, uh-huh. So I should probably have put a equal sign here. That was immediately obvious what went wrong. But we can still look at that CPU peak, hopefully. Oh, looks like we're running low on memory, but we can close the browser, no problem. Okay, so what you doing, dude? Spin lock, oh, all that debug um, printing that we're doing is at the top of the profile. That's pretty nasty. And then we have memset and malloc from the JS parser, sure. Um, okay, I mean, that's nothing too crazy. Mutexes in malloc, like a percent to lock, one and a half percent plus one and a half percent lock and unlock. So roughly 3% of time just in the malloc mutex. Um, could imagine doing a thread local cache for malloc to get rid of that. Uh, da, 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 da. But nothing too wild. Maybe these completions should be in line. Hmm. Okay, so maybe, maybe this gets way better if we don't have that logging coming out like this, but at the same time, then we won't see problems. So let's just keep the logging on and make sure that we commit that correction. Wait, what the heck did I just do? Okay, I'm making a little bit of a mess there, but we should be good. Okay, so here's that query command enabled thing. And there isn't really anything outside of that. We got require here. Maybe we should download this thing and see what it is. Require crypto. Hmm. Wait, what is require? It's not a keyword, is it? Yeah, yep, 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 yep. I guess it's maybe some node thing or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, since it was within a context where it just catches errors, it's not a big deal. So what's going on with the page layout then? Hmm. Okay, let's look at it in Firefox to see what we can see here. So we should have something in the middle. They're not letting me right click. <laughs> all right, all right. You want to play that game? Um, okay, so. Let's dig into 
right here, we have a section. This div right here within somebody called wrapper. All right, so we have div wrapper. And then this little div guy right here. And we can see a slight purple line up here. Um, which is indicating where that box is. But I don't know why it's up there, I would expect it to be in the middle of the page. So let's take a look at the layout tree. And then we have the name of it was uh, wrapper dash one F five by N. Okay, this guy right here. Okay, this guy is positioned at zero zero. The wrapper is positioned at zero zero. Okay, that checks out. We have purple magenta going right up there. And wrapper here is wait, can we see the box? It's absolute positioning. Sure. Uh, and then he has something inside right here. That's 780 with this size. So I would expect it to be much larger. It's already weird that like it should be at X78. I guess it is. If you look at that magenta line, yeah, that's 78 pixels in. And zero, but then the size here doesn't match up with reality because we're at least we're not painting it like that. Hmm. I wonder if the SVG is messing us up. This is um, it's a fairly complex page. So we should be seeing the text opening Discord app somewhere. Hmm. Just trying to divine what might be going wrong because yeah well, why wouldn't that work so um painting happens in layers like uh, you paint the backgrounds as one layer then you paint the borders as one layer and then you do the foreground and the topmost layer is the sort of inspector uh, layer where we show outlines for whatever you've selected here in the inspector. We we're supposed to paint that on top of everything else. So the fact that we're just seeing this thin little magenta here is very strange. If I scroll, it does at least respect the scroll position. But this is all making me wonder if the SVG is covering everything somehow. Maybe it has a Z index or something. Oh, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe the um, SVG is just forced on top of everything. Let's see. Z index zero. Um, hmm. Let's see if we can just get rid of the SVG and not paint it. So we'll just like not create a layout node for SVG for the root SVG element and see what happens. See if there's like a bunch of stuff hiding underneath.
because there's like a thin slice uh, at the very top of the page where I feel like I can peek through just a tiny little bit. Um, I guess we can use the magnifier to look at it. See if we can spot something strange. Um, so now we should just ignore the SVG element when it comes to page layout and rendering. Well, let's see what that means in practice. If anything. Hello. Hmm. So I guess this is what the page looks like with no SVG. Wait, no, now it didn't load anything. Hmm. That was probably a botched load though, because, um, just because we refuse to instantiate a layout node for the SVG element, um, it should not prevent any JavaScript or anything like that from running. So it's, it's entirely possible here that we have flaky loads that like stuff's going wrong that we don't understand and the load breaks because of that. So let's just try again, basically. Namespace is the X. Wait, did I not fix this? Did I screw this up? Oh no, I did screw it up. How do I keep screwing up? What the heck? Okay, well, I evidently screw this up somehow again. Hmm. Maybe I pressed um, undo or redo at the wrong time or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, if we don't throw the exception, then what happens? Okay, so. This is what's underneath the SVG. All right, so this is a lot more interesting than nothing. So it's not in the center of the page, which should be expected. That's probably a bug in our uh, Flexbox implementation that it doesn't uh, center the thing correctly, but at least we can see that we have a horizontally centered um, div here that puts the text and, oh, and it takes us to discord.com as well. <laughs> and then I guess we have some asset image here that we're not, yeah, too close to the memory ceiling to be able to generate uh, crash reports. That's silly. The image URL, let's see. Let's see if we can download that image. Um, not sure what I'm looking at here. Can we fill with some other color? Oh, look at that. It's a discord. Uh, <laughs> wait, that was not the best way to do that. I should make a Oh, wow, that's so hard to see that it's white. Maybe we didn't choose the best colors here. Um, the default colors, I mean, for pixel paint. So let's make a new layer, put it underneath, and then fill this black. There we go. That's what we're supposed to be seeing on the page. Wonder why it doesn't work. That's interesting. Hmm. Anyway. Um, 
that's certainly something that we need to figure out as well. Why doesn't that image load? So why is the SVG on top of everything? And why is the image not loading? Um, two questions. Let's investigate, I suppose. So the SVG thing, how do we figure that out? I guess one thing we can do is we can look at a dump of the layout tree to see if we can um, if we can print out also the Z index of everybody. I don't think we do that at the moment, but we could start doing that. And then we could learn if somebody has a, a goofy Z index or maybe, maybe SVG elements are always painting at a dumb time. Hmm. But on this page, the SVG is before, let's look at the DOM order. Because worst case, I think our SVG renders as a foreground layer. We can confirm that first of all. Uh, our SVG implementation, by the way, is extremely naive. So it does not do almost anything correctly. <laughs> uh, just something to be aware of. Paint face foreground seems to be the paint face that we care about. Yeah. So say that we have a path box that wants to paint. It paints in the foreground paint face. And uh, these are the paint phases I was talking about earlier, where I was calling them layers, but really they are phases. So there's background, border, foreground, focus and outline, and overlay. That's our inspector overlay. Um, so SVG paints exclusively in the foreground paint phase at the moment. Probably incorrectly, but even so, um, things within the same paint phase should paint in DOM order. So anything that comes after the SVG in DOM order should end up on top of the SVG, which is what I would expect to happen um, to the content here. Yeah, because this, this div right here um, is within this wrapper and the SVG that covers the screen is right before it, or let's verify. Yes, it's right before. Hmm. Hmm. That's odd. And does it have a Z index auto, at least here in Firefox on the SVG? Does anybody have goofy Z index? I mean, it's not for sure that it's related to Z index. It could be something else as well. Um, establishes stacking context. If it's absolutely positioned, it will make a stacking context, I guess. It is absolutely positioned or it's fixed position, which means that it will create um, a stacking context. Hmm. So what does that mean in practice that this thing creates a stacking context? A stacking context is essentially um, sort of a subtree that renders as a single unit. And then uh, when you put Z index on an element, um, then that element will establish its own stacking context so that everything within that element is rendered on top of the element. And then the element itself um, is rendered in stacking context order so that all the different stacking contexts in your page are correctly stacked. Um, I'm not explaining that super well, but you can, you can read about stacking contexts on MDN, for example. A three-dimensional conceptualization of HTML elements along an imaginary z-axis. That's right. So I wonder if we're screwing something up here because we have something creating a stacking context and then his sibling does not create a stacking context. Oh wait, he does. Position absolute. Hmm. Hmm. 
So there should be two stacking contexts. One for this guy, one for this guy. And then they should be in frickin' DOM order. Why? Okay, we have to, um, we have to log some things so, so we can see what's happening. Um, let's see. Is, what is SVG, SVG box anyway? It's a SVG graphics box, which is an SVG box, which is a block container. Sure. Probably not 100% correctly modeled, but who cares? Um, so let's go to dump.cpp. And then look at where we dump out layout nodes. So what we'll want to do is we want to show, oh, we can show specified style actually. That would be pretty sweet. Let's just um, let's just turn that on like that, and maybe we'll get everything we need because Z index is just one of many specified style properties, right? Although I wonder if this is going to get brutally spammy now, um, because we'll see all the possible CSS properties. I guess we'll find out. You know what? Let's just test it here to see what it looks like. Um. Yeah, so you, you end up seeing every CSS property for everything. But maybe that's not a bad thing. However, let's give ourselves some more RAM. Four gigs will be better. I don't like hitting the RAM ceiling and seeing things fail because of that. Oh yeah, but now I have to re-enable the SVG um, SVG element layout node so that we actually get something obstructing the text. Um, there we go. I'm I'm curious to find out what the problem here is if it's. Um, SVG specific or something more general in the engine. Um, but soon enough, we will know more. Okay, let's take a look at that layout tree. Oh man. All right. Well, we can just search for one F five by N. That was the wrapper. So this wrapper right here, Z index auto. Sure. And then, you know, man, this will be a real hassle actually. Artwork L five T a. TA, that's the SVG. Z index auto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. Maybe what I want to dump out is a stacking context list, actually. I don't even remember if we have a way to dump that. Stacking context dump. All right. Let's let's dump it. Um I don't think we have a menu option for that. Dump layout. Dump layout tree. Yeah, let's um let's add an option for that. Dump stacking context tree. Would be a good thing to have.
let's see if ICP stacking context. Yeah, so just adding a little bit of code to dump that. That would be really fascinating to see what it looks like. So essentially, the way we render is that we start by dividing the page into stacking contexts. And then we paint uh, one stacking context at a time, starting from the back, as I recall. And then um, that's how we get them to stack on top of each other. Maybe we can make a miniature test case for this thing in a moment. Just uh, see what's happening here. It's not terribly busy. The stacking context tree is, is usually pretty small. So here's what we have. Um, so what did we have? I mean, it would be good to see a little bit more about who's who here, who's who, like um, the class name and IDs, same as we do in dump function. This guy is really cool about um, coming up with a cool name for the DOM nodes. So let's, let's yoink that logic a little bit. Call it identifier. Hmm. Um, stacking context dump. Yeah, and then mbox dom node. Yeah, hack, hack, hack. Very hack. Um. Yeah, so the idea now is just to get like um, more specific information about these elements in the stacking context tree because we were just seeing what the tag name was and I would like to also see what's the ID and uh, any classes if present so that we can identify them in the Firefox inspector here, for example. Also, yeah, let's make this a bit bigger. It's obnoxiously small. I don't know why I had it so small. Um, here we go. Okay. So SVG, SVG box, we have two of those. So I guess this is the main rendering subtree. Um, here's the wrapper. And he has an SVG SVG box sibling, but the wrapper here comes before the SVG artwork. Wait, was that correct? Here, the wrapper is after, but in our stacking context, tree dump at least for some reason the wrapper comes uh, before the artwork and the logo comes before the artwork wait what wait 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 hold on so the order here the correct order is logo artwork wrapper our order is wrapper artwork logo so are we creating these backwards mm. Well, that's extremely possible. Let's see how that's how we create these things. I guess whoever calls establishes stacking context, build stacking context tree. That's where we want to go. Okay.
for each inclusive subtree of type. So every box descendant, we will visit and check. If the box does not establish a stacking context, we will simply continue on to the next box. Sure. Otherwise, we will make a new box and insert it into the parent. Hmm. Wait, why would that go wrong though? Okay, so what does the parent do? When you construct somebody with a parent, then we append it here. Wait. And then we sort them based on Z index. Okay, these fix me's here are extremely suspicious. Don't sort on every append, and apparently this also breaks tree order inside layers. Yeah, you don't say. Uh, that's exactly what we are observing. Is this fix me right here? Who wrote this? Uh, Igor, I think. Um, indeed. Okay, so um, Igor was working on paint order spec compliance. Uh, it was quite a while ago now. Let's find out when that was actually, or I guess it says right here in May of 2021. So uh, really awesome work, um, made a huge progress on the ACID2 test um, with his work, but we are missing some crucial stuff here. So what's going on here? We are essentially taking all of the children of a stacking context and resorting them um, based on Z index, not respecting DOM order. So let's see, what's the correct approach here? I guess a simple way to solve this would be uh, if you have two stacking context siblings with identical Z order, then you order them based on DOM order instead. I guess that would be the easiest approach to do. Um, let's see, how do we do that? So if, um, let's see, a z index, we have two, two um, siblings here, a and b. So a z index is, let's just extract this information a little bit. So that we can uh, reason about it. Um, without having to write these long things. I'm probably going to miss something now too, but um, but at least we should be able to get a quick fix in here just to... Um, just to respect tree order in case of identical Z index. So um, a, how do we know if something is before something else? What are these? These are layout nodes. So um, how do you know if somebody's before? I guess you would walk. Oh, wait, they might not necessarily be siblings of the same dom parent so hmm dom node before other node how do you determine that there's some api for that is element before or after compare document position that's what i'm thinking of so how do we implement that node is before okay so we have this API, man, who wrote that it is before me. Ooh, thank you. Past Andreas. Ah, that's so nice of you. <laughs> so if a is before, um, B, I guess. Yeah, that's what is the type of children? Oh, wait, shit. Um, I have to ask about the box. So M box is before B M box. Okay. Let's see if that works. 
Hmm. Wouldn't that be nice? I'm actually going to start by just checking on acid 2 to see that it's not a horrible regression. Doesn't look like a horrible regression to me. I mean, no progression either, but nothing terribly broken. So let's see if it does anything with our problem. So if they are identical, we will sort based on A relative to B in tree order. Hmm. Hmm. Um. Not sure if success or failure. I mean, probably not success, but let's see what we ended up with. Stacking context tree. Oh, wait, so now we're just missing the thing instead? Hmm. I feel like we didn't load correctly this time. Uh, okay, it didn't load correctly again. Yeah, I don't know why sometimes it doesn't load right. But let's add that debug option for the stacking context tree, because that's a simple thing to have. Browser, add uh, debug menu action for dumping the stacking context tree. Ooh, look at that. Progress. That's nice. All right. All right. Um, we're moving forward <laughs> one step at a time. So let's uh, commit that little, little hack here. Um, also, we can, I guess, nuke that thing. Libweb, um, preserve tree order of um, sibling stacking context with same Z index. Um, keep tree order of sibling stacking contexts. Look at me fitting it in 72 characters. Yeah. Okay, so now, why doesn't this image load? That's what I want to know. So maybe we can, maybe we can, let's try to use the JavaScript console. I had a bit of bad luck with that last time, but let's, let's see. Um, images is document query selector all. Let's get all the images. Oop, invite invalid. I don't know what happened. He didn't like it. Um, but let's see how many images we found. One. Okay. Image is zero. That's this guy right here. He has some React fields, apparently. His source is empty. Okay. Well, that's alarming. Images get attribute source null. So why does it display this alt text? Is it the alt attribute? I wonder. Nope. That's really strange. Let's take a look at it in the see if we can get to it here. Hmm. So it's somewhere in here. Video. Um, 
Oh, wait, shit. I guess this is an old copy of the DOM. Because it updated. Uh, but the image should still be there, though. Oh, now I made it mad. <laughs> I think he doesn't like when I keep um, futzing around like that. Yeah, it's a little unstable. Um, okay. A bit too dead. Let's reload. See what's happening. Also, our crash reporter application has problems. Okay, wait, so we crashed in page host, page did request cookie. And then we didn't want to give up the cookie. Um, guess we didn't do it all for the nookie. Anyway, let's see. If we can get there in time. I'm just going to pretend that this is a timed event. Okay, here's our section, our class, the h3, awkwardly to the side, uh, but the text is in the right place. I don't know why the h3 is mispositioned. Um, then we have a div with a video. Okay, so we have a video um, tag with an img inside of it, and said img does have a source. Hmm. The display of this video is in line. Okay, sure. So we, obvi we obviously don't know how to handle a video element, but we just treat it as an inline element, which means that we do produce this image box, as you can see, but I don't know why the image doesn't load. That is a bit weird. Hmm. I would assume that they call... I mean, at some point somebody sets a source attribute on it. Let's see. A non-empty source attribute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see what happens here. Like, um, can we just dump this out? Or wait, we log all the requests actually. So we should be able to see a PNG request. Here somewhere, so dot PNG. Oh, there's a, um, wait, it's right here, diff87.png. There's this guy right here. We are loading it. And then what? Also, it's a 15 second load. That's <laughs> substantial, substantial uh, load time on that thing. Um, but I think we end up with these long load times because we um, busy ourselves with JavaScript for a long time. And then, you know, it, it says that, oh, once we stop running JavaScript, all the resources start coming in. But it's just our fault because we were busy running JavaScript. It's not like the server takes 15 seconds to send us these. Um, we could definitely get better at um, recording the actual arrival time of resources. So what you're really seeing is like, how long did it take until libweb reacted to the resource coming in? Um, okay, so, so we actually do fire off the load. Presumably we get the image back. Um, but it seems like we're not able to render it meaningfully. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and copy that image URL. Let's see if we can create a test page for this. Um, maybe even with the browser. Okay, that does not load. Wonder why. Hmm, where do I see that? Let's see if other things could load, like serenityos.org slash buggy png. Um, 
I don't remember what, <laughs> what kind of images I have there. I have to go and check. What is this one called? Banner2.png. Okay, so this just does not work here. I guess maybe it's um, just refusing to do an external request in the um, text editor. Hmm. Or maybe it's a redirect failure. I wonder. We're not really learning what's going wrong, though. Hmm. Let's see. What if we... Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to allow uh, web content to look into my home directory just so that just to ease debugging because that means I can create a I can just create a file in my home directory and open it in the browser. Normally we don't allow that for security reasons. Uh, we just sandbox the browser so it can't access your home directory. But right now I kind of want to just debug stuff. Um, so I actually had the URL right here, which is convenient. Um, so let's do something here. Image source, this save. That appears to actually load. Wait, but now it just works. Okay, so it works if I load it from here with the URL, exactly the same URL as the browser would use. Um, interesting, I wonder why we mess it up. If we're actually live. Ah, could be any number of things. Anyway, um, need to actually round down this video. So I think maybe we'll just stop here and leave something fun for the next time. Uh, <laughs> there's obviously a lot more stuff to do. Um, this time gap here where nothing happens, no CPU usage, which is waiting. That's kind of suspicious. I wonder what that's about. Is that a failed load once again? I guess so. Yeah, need to figure out what those are. But at least we made a whole bunch of progress. We um, implemented set attribute NS. We um, made the optimization for index property iterators. And uh, then we found the problem with um, stacking context, not preserving sibling order when they had the same Z index as each other. And now I'm growing concerned that the page is not showing up anymore. <laughs> But this is also something that happens sometimes when you are debugging live websites that like sometimes they just start behaving differently and you don't know if it's something on your end or if they, if you've been like caught by um, some automatic system that um, tries to just prevent repeated uh, bot access or something like that. Or maybe, um, maybe sometimes they update their assets and something that you assumed was a certain way stops working. Could be any number of things. It's uh, just the just the hazards of working on a moving target like this. Um, but I'm going to try a couple more times here to see if if the SVG comes up. Hmm. We're not throwing anything new, are we? I don't think.
bit strange. Okay. So what changes did I make? I just um, unveiled my home directory. And then we screwed around with um, loading the image remotely. Which I wonder if that tripped something. I don't feel like it should. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it's just flaky. Um, fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, here we are. This is good progress for today. So I think we will we'll stop here. And um, I hope you saw something interesting. I, I certainly enjoy this type of work. It's very satisfying, even though it's frustrating at times when you make no progress or things are flaky. Um, I think it's still still really interesting work. So I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you very much for checking it out, hanging out with me while I continue to work on this. Um, guess I'll see you next time. Bye.